Pearson, who I don't know if they're actually in here at the moment. But um, Pearson Publishing is one who's hosting the uh, bar and the dessert table. <laughs> The bar was from 6 to 9 p.m. So if you want anything to drink, get it before 9. Um, if you want harder drinks than are served at the bar, you have to go to the restaurant down the hall. There's a bar in there for whatever other beverages you would like to indulge in. Um, oh, dessert will be coming out after the um, Ignite presentations during the game night portion that Pearson will be putting on for us. And I think every year that's been a lot of fun. So hopefully you'll all stick around for the game night. Um, Edgar um, Espina has always done a great job of putting this on. And really thrilled that he's doing that. That will be starting at 8. The Ignite is the brainchild of, well, I think he saw it somewhere else. I guess that he takes better for uh, starting it. But Rich Zucker is our Ignite expert, and he is going to lead us to a very exciting evening of Ignite presentations that will ignite you for whatever you need to ignite. <laughs> so everybody enjoy the evening, and we'll see you tomorrow at the uh, conference. So my first uh, experience with Ignite was in Jacksonville uh, last November at the AMATIC conference and I volunteered to do a five minute presentation. Several of the people in this room were also part of that. Uh, I think three of us are going to be doing repeats tonight. Um, here's, here's what the Ignite group, which is actually the brainchild of some people who work for O'Reilly Media, they're a, 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 it's a technology publishing company. Um, this is what they say on the website. Ignite is a fast-paced, geek event. Yeah! It's just for us. Started by Bradley Forrest, technology evangelist for O'Reilly Media, and Bree Pettis of MakerBot.com, formerly of Make Magazine. Speakers are given 20 slides, each shown for 15 seconds, giving each speaker five minutes of fame. The first Ignite took place in Seattle in 2006, and since then, the event has become an international phenomenon, with gatherings in Helsinki, Paris, France, uh, New York, and many other locations, including Anaheim, California. Um, they have a motto, and the motto is terrific. I love it. It's, Enlighten us, but make it quick. <laughs> so, um, we have nine presenters tonight. I don't even know, and I'm praying they're all here, but I haven't met them all. We've been communicating by email. Um, the presenters, seven out of the nine, are actually people who will be doing their hour long presentations tomorrow. And I invited all of the speakers, and those seven decided to join us tonight to maybe do an Ignite talk for five minutes, that would be a way of promoting their talk for tomorrow. And some will do that, others have chosen to just do something else altogether, which will be fun. Um, by the way, I forgot a major rule, besides the five minute, you know, 20 slides, 15 seconds, there is another major rule. Apparently all Ignite events have to be done in the presence of a bar. <laughs> And, uh, and, that, and that bar, fortunately, being hosted by Pearson, it's all free. Help yourselves. And as I recall in Jacksonville, Fred, Fred was doing what I'm doing now. He, Fred Feldman right here was the uh, coordinator of that event. And he had a drink in his hand the whole night. <laughs> I'm afraid I'm not going to be able to follow you. Yeah, and when I gave my talk, the speaker after me, I had left my drink on the podium accidentally. The speaker after me came up and slug, took a slug or two from my to warm up for his presentation. As I remember, he got really dizzy just a few minutes after that, too. He got drunk on one slug. Um, so, uh, let's see here where I was. Um, yeah, so you know what I'd like to do right now is I'm gonna I'm just gonna call roll and find out where or if the speakers are all here. So is Jeremiah Gilbert here? Is Jeremiah, that's Jeremiah. Nice to meet you. Jeremiah is going to be our very first speaker in a moment. Brian Boudry. Brian, nice to meet you. Did you get, did you get some speech today? Yes. 
He got to the Fort Beach, excellent. And uh, Dave Sobecki. Dave, nice to meet you. I know Larry Perez is here. Where are you, Larry? There you are. And Larry is actually a, a former Ignite speaker, but you're going to do something brand new tonight, not something you did last time. Uh, Jeff, Jeff Cycoli. How do you say it, Jeff? Jeff Cycoli. Cycoli. And Jeff is uh, new to it tonight. Gail, are you here? Gail Brown? Gail, Gail was having, she emailed me earlier that the weather in the Midwest was making it difficult uh, for airplanes to be on time. So maybe by the time she's up, <laughs> she'll walk in and have to come right up and give her talk. Teresa Sutcliffe. Teresa's right here. Hi, Teresa. And uh, Richard Zucker. Oh, that's me. I put myself on the list because I didn't know if we'd have enough people. <laughs> but, but I do have something that I'm passionate about that I want to talk about for five minutes. And then finally, closing us up, Fred Feldman, right here. Yeah. Okay, so um, I'm gonna, Fred, you had a little box marked on the ground when, in Jacksonville, but I'm gonna do something that's a little less high tech. Uh, for all the speakers, um, this bottle represents where approximately where you should stand so that you're not going to be in the way of the projector, but you'll still be in the frame of the camera. So I'm going to put the bottle down there. So I think this is good. Now, just so you know, I'm talking to the presenters. There's a computer right up here, my laptop, which is presenting exactly what everybody else can see. So you don't have to turn around to see what's on the screen. You can just look down there and keep, keep pace with your talk. Okay, good. All right. Between talks, I've put a slide. You know, it's going to advance automatically, but as soon as the talk is over, there'll be a slide, this slide, in fact, which will stop. And we can take a moment to reset, get the next presenter to come up. And during that time, if you want to, you can ask questions of the speaker who was just up here. Or you can get another drink. That's important. You've got to get a drink. Uh, and we'll be done in about uh, 45 minutes, that's 9 times 5, plus a little extra for the transitions in between. Okay, last rule. If we're not having fun, we're doing it wrong. So let's do it right and make sure we have a lot of fun tonight. First up, here are my... Yeah. <laughs> there you go. Okay, so I'm one of the presenters tomorrow that decided to do something that has nothing to do with what I'm presenting tomorrow. So this is about happy numbers, and it's related to an episode of Doctor Who. So tenth Doctor, woohoo, David Tennant. <laughs> so let's set the stage. So we have a spaceship currently towards a star, and the Doctor has 42 minutes to save the ship. This is from the episode called 42. I was told it was a play on 24. So, there's a series of locked doors. You need to enter, have to answer a quiz to enter each door. One of the last ones, most of the most important ones, this is the answer. 313, 331, 367, 379. This opens it. So, what about it? Well, what this is is a consecutive sequence of happy prime numbers. So, I'll let you think about that. So, I see that face on a few people. <laughs> That's why I picked it. So, when the doctor learns that nobody on the ship has ever heard of happy numbers, he asks, don't they teach recreational mathematics anymore? He wasn't quite this angry, but yeah, I'm going for impact here. So, what is a happy number? Start with any positive integer, replace the sum of its squares until you get to one. You take the sum of the squares, try it again, try it again. You either get to one, which is where it stays, or you'll end up with a simple cycle that never touches one. The numbers that get to one, happy numbers. If they don't get to one, and they'll never get to one, then they're unhappy numbers, or sad numbers. It does add in the rain to the sad, so they're really sad numbers. So for instance, 19 is happy. One squared plus nine squared gives me 82. Eight squared plus two squared is 68. 6 squared plus 8 squared is 100, 1 squared plus 0 squared plus 0 squared, 1. We did it with 1, we have ourselves a happy number. So, I know you can't read all these in 15 seconds, 
But just to give you a sense, these are the first few happy numbers. You notice there's a couple sequential, mostly gaps, we have evens, we have odds. These are the happy numbers, and they can all be found doing what we just did. So a happy prime, which is what the doctor entered, it's a number that's both happy and prime. So seven's particularly happy. So 13, 19, 23, these are the happy prime numbers. So obviously a lot less of those than there are happy numbers. A few interesting happy properties. You can rearrange the digits. So 19 is happy, so is 91. You can insert or remove zeros. So if 19 is happy, so is 109, so is 190. Interesting. Also, every number in the sequence is happy. And so I included this picture of the doctor, because now we're talking about recreational math, and he's happy. So, so let me show you what I just made, what I mean by this. So go back to that sequence before. The 1 squared plus 9 squared is 82. Guess what? That's a happy number. And then 68 is a happy number. 100 is a happy number. It makes sense if you think about it, because they all lead to 1. So they're going to get happy. Next up, I decided to tell you some special happy numbers. So I'll let you prove these. The greatest happy number with no repeated digits. That this is cool, it has everything but a 7. So again, if you're really bored tonight, you can test this. You're just going to have to trust me on this one. Smallest pan digital happy number. And then the smallest zeroless pan digital. Notice the exact same number, just remove the zero. Because a happy number, you can add or remove zeros at will. Rather interesting. A couple more. Smallest pan digital hadronic happy number. <laughs> I should tattoo that somewhere. And again, remove the zeros and you have the smallest zero-less digital palindromic happy number. Man, see that's even fast. The origin of happy numbers is not clear. All I can find out is that Reg Allenby, British author and senior lecturer in pure mathematics, was his daughter who learned them at school. <laughs> Someone says they think they were Russian, but they're not sure. Now, sad numbers. The interesting thing is, if a number is sad, they have the exact same fate. They don't go to one, they hit four, and then they go into an endless cycle. If any of you watch Doctor Who, you don't watch that Weeping Angel. The sequence is always the same. If it doesn't go to one, it goes to four, 16, 37, 58, 89, 145, 42, 24. And it just kind of spins around like the TARDIS, which is the Doctor's ship. Do you have any happy or unhappy questions? I'm Jeremiah Gilbert. If there's my email, notice there's no T. Thank you. So why not go a trillion? 
Are you a trillion seconds old? Is our country a trillion seconds old? Well, actually, no. 29,500 BC, give or take a few years, was a trillion seconds ago. So now you've seen million, or thousand million, thousand million, billion, trillion, I want you to consider this. This is why I put the slides so together. That's where I got this website I got it at, and go ahead and say the number out loud. Sixteen trillion, five hundred twenty-five billion. Now you see the difference between a billion, a thousand million, billion, trillion. See how they grow? Even though they're all powers of, you know, the exponents only growing by three, they all grow at the same rate. But the whole idea of this is to show, you know, how big numbers can relate. So here's a, here's a small number example. Mega Millions, I know it's played in California. I just read that last week when I put this together. So your probability winning Mega Millions is one out of 175 million, 711, 526. Pretty small, but how small is it? Well, imagine if you will, you decide to leave Anaheim and drive north and east. For some reason, you just drive to drive 175 million, 711,536 inches. So how many miles is that? Well, I'll tell you. <laughs> so my question is, where would you end up? New York? Anybody else? Maine. Chicago? Maine? Spain? Spain? No. <laughs> That's where I ended up. Now, I started in Disneyland because that was the only thing I really knew was in Anaheim. So, if I could have found a better, maybe not very far, would have been a better choice. So, I'm like four and a half miles off. All right, but the really big question is this. What represents the winning ticket? One inch of row from Anaheim to New York City. Now you know why you never win. <laughs> All right, so what do we want numbers to do? We want to help our students articulate their ideas, express themselves with precision, ground their observations and evidence, test hypotheses, participate in civil discord, recognize the uncertainty, and form critical thinking. That's what numbers should do, not solve for X. That's not what numbers are about. We want our students to understand this stuff. We want to be able to read the newspaper and understand what the heck they're talking about. Penetrate below the surface level. No one politicians are lying to them. It happens every once in a while, I heard. Uh, and above all, we want them to develop number sense. That's what we're really shooting for with this. Anyway, so here's now my 15 second commercial of my talk tomorrow. And I can't read this fast enough, so you're going to have to just read it. Um, basically, I'm. Well, you can read it. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. So if you're interested, please come. It's 9 o'clock, that's how I'm doing that. A uh, final thought about quantitative literacy, if individuals lack the ability to think numerically, um, they can't participate fully in civic life. Students need both mathematics and numeracy. Numeracy is another word for quantitative literacy. Uh, thank you very much. My email is there in case you want to talk to me about this, and that's it. I think Brian just proved that you can put as much text on a slide like this in this kind of an event as long as you talk very fast. <laughs> that was great, Brian. Uh, that, that analogy with the path from Anaheim to New York and the winning the lottery. That I gotta add is... one thing. I gave that I gave that presentation or I gave that example about five years ago uh, when I was in New Hampshire, which was the state I came from before I was in Arizona. And one of my teachers in the audience said, Thank God you gave this, because now I can tell my my husband why buying twenty tickets doesn't make any difference. <laughs> That's right. That's right. Because you think of the probability it slices down from 175 million one to one to you know, the number gets a lot smaller, but what are you buying? You're buying 20 inches of rope. <laughs> so. Very good. Excellent. Dave! He's behind me. He's also in the Hi. Here, I'll hand this up. Thank you very much. And I see you're prepared. I am. It's a problem. Right. Are you ready? <laughs> I am. Not only am I not talking about what I'm talking about tomorrow, I put the slides together Wednesday while I was packing for my trip from Ohio. So the idea is, can I give 18 teaching tips in less than five minutes? If I can, here's to me. <laughs> All right, so good words and bad ones. The first good word, exercise. Yeah. Exercise as an analogy, not exercise like homework problems. Exercise like why do we do math? It is exercise for your brain. Well, this is stupid. I'm never going to use it. When you run, do you use that? What do you, bank robber, run away from the police? Huh? <laughs> it's exercise. Hard. Oh, but math is hard. That's what makes it good. You know what else is really easy? Lifting one pound weights, and it does you no good at all. If math was easy, everybody would do it, and your degree wouldn't be worth any more than your high school diploma was. Hard. Good. Can't 
result. Cancel this word from your teaching vocabulary. When you, use, when you let students use the word cancel, they honestly think there is a mathematical operation called cancel, and they start crossing stuff out because it looks the same. Make them call it division. Input and output. Best way to teach function principles. I like the idea of dependent variable because it gives you the cause and effect relationship, but students get wrapped up in the variable independent dependent, they don't get it. When you teach them input and output, it helps with understanding functions, graphing, many other things. Ask your students to explain things to you. You explain concepts to them, you expect them to care. To try to understand those concepts, they won't care that much unless they know it's going to affect their grade. And the only way to do that is to insist that they explain things to you. Mimic. Do not train your students to mimic. There are times when I do certain problems and I say, I'm training you here, and I mean that to be an insult. Because you can train an animal to do things. Don't train your students to mimic. Teach them to think and understand. And a big part of that, friends, is context. There should be context to everything you do in your teaching. If you can't give context that says, here's what this is good for, here's why we're doing it, don't freaking do it. <laughs> Backwards. Teach backwards. Historically, where did math come from? Did people sit around and say, you know what, I'm going to find what x is, and then I'll figure out how to apply it to something? Isn't that how we teach? We do applications last. Teach backwards from the traditional approach. Tell students, this is where the math came from. Solving problems like this. Don't use the term real world. Please. I have been as guilty as this as anyone. I've been sanitizing it from my books for the last couple of weeks because I realize this is so self-defeating. When we say, oh, here's a real world example, it's reinforcing the idea that most of what we do is crap. But this is the whole story. Don't use the word story problems and don't give them story problems. Stories are fiction. They're made up. They're silly. They're artificial. Work harder to find application problems that sound real. Variable. I have no idea why I put that in here. Yes. <laughs> can your students say what, can they tell you what a variable is? You know what they'll say? Oh, it's a letter like X. Eh. No, it's not. A variable is a quantity that can vary. It's not a letter. Alex, if you're not familiar with Alex, get familiar with Alex. Okay, one of the best, one of the problems we run into is students of varying abilities with background deficiencies. Alex is the answer to that. It can help students get up to speed while they are in a class relatively inexpensively. Don't use the word assume. Mathematicians know that that word means something different than what it means in plain English. Students do not. When you say, oh, let's assume that something, they automatically think, oh, well, you know, then that's really vague. Well, why should I assume? They don't know what that means. Think of something else, or at least define it for them. Ask your students to discover things on their own. Give them worksheets occasionally, group activities, projects, that allows them to discover rules, discover why things do and don't work on their own, and they will remember them better. When you talk about graphing, talk about interpretation. Do not train them to play connect the dots. They are not kindergartners. Graphing is about interpreting data in a graphical format that makes it easier to understand what it is trying to say. Start graphing that way and maybe they'll get it. Rate of change. Can your students say what slope is other than, well, it's like some number. And if, if we're lucky, they know that it means how steep a line is. It's a rate of change. They get that. They like it. Believe me. They're like, wow, why didn't you say that stuff? Formal. When you write things for your students, tests, quizzes, handouts, worksheets, study guides, don't write like you wrote in grad school. You're not trying to impress anybody with your conciseness or your precision. Don't write formally. It puts the students off and instantly tells them, I can't get this. Roadblocks. What is the biggest roadblock students face in developmental algebra, beginning or developmental education, beginning in intermediate algebra? There are alternate pathways out there that are being developed nationwide. Look into them. For non-STEM students, there are a way around those roadblocks. And my final two bonus words, thank you. Yeah. I'm going to go get another beer. <laughs> All right, Dave, you gotta, you gotta explain something, though, because I asked you. It says 12 good words and 7 bad ones, but you started out by saying 18 teaching tips. So, yeah. uh, input and output, two words. Oh, okay. <laughs> All right, got it. I was worried if I was a typo, he said, should I be worried that 12 plus 7 is 19? And I just said, trust me, I'm a doctor. <laughs> <laughs> Very good. Wow, wonderful. Okay, Larry, are you already behind me? Yeah, <laughs> behind me. 
All right, Larry Perez. Are you ready? I'm ready. Okay, hi, I'm Larry Perez from South Bank College, and today I'm going to discuss with you uh, a new type of worksheet where embedded QR, QR codes allow students the ability to instruct their smartphones to deliver content in an assistive way. So let's talk about worksheets in general. Uh, occasionally we make worksheets for our students so they can go home and practice uh, skills that we just covered in our lectures. And so in a couple of days, they come and they start the problems. And then they get stuck with a particular step. And the skill that prevents them from continuing on is likely a skill that we lectured on in the previous lecture. Or it's a skill they should have mastered in the previous math course. So what do your students do when they get stuck? Well, if they're in a tutoring center, they'll sit there and raise their hand to try to get a tutor to help them. Well, they'll have to wait. It's very likely that one of these handheld computers is sitting right there in their working environment, not being used. So suppose the student's at home, and she gets stuck. And she, what's she going to do? She's going to take this handheld computer and put it into folder friend mode, and try to contact up here over the phone to try to get guidance, which usually doesn't work. So what can we do as instructors, as authors of these type of worksheets? Well, we can now invent a QR code that provides immediate access to content that's directly related to the skill to allow the students to progress under the problem. And uh, the, why stop there? Why not provide the student with an audio file that walks the students step by step through the problems in our own voice? And then instruct the students to go to the second problem and tell them to complete the problem to see if they can get the correct answer. So this type of organization of content is somewhat emulates what we try to do in a traditional classroom setting. So let's talk about a little bit about theory here. Well, suppose this area represents all the skills that an algebra student can do without any assistance, like hopefully add, subtract, multiply, and divide with integers and fractions and decimals. And this outer region represents all the skills that the students cannot do and could not do even if we tried to explain it to them. So what is the region in between these two regions? This region represents all the skills that these algebra uh, students can not do, but can do with the encourage, encouragement and guidance of us as the instructor. And so this is what's known as Vygotsky's Zone of Proximal Development. So when we're in the classroom teaching students, we try to progress students through the zones to get them to, higher, to think at a higher level of cognitive thought with our pedagogical techniques. But of course, we have the students who come up and say, Mr. President, you do this, it's so easy. I can't do what I get at home. I'm stuck. Do you have any advice? He says, yeah, you can take me home with you <laughs> on a sheet of paper. And that's all they need. And so, uh, one of the things that, uh, oh, yeah, here, hold on. And so, let's uh, talk about what is assistive instructional content. Well, when a student gets stuck in a particular step and they scan the code, a definition comes up. So we're not going to show them how to actually do the content, or how to actually do the distributive property. We're going to make them think about the definition and apply it to the actual skill of doing the distributive property. We can also give them visual cues, not a video. For instance, how to multiply a whole number into a fraction and let the student think about, give them the freedom to think about their own technique and let them apply it to the problem. And because these devices have touch screens, we can design online tools and let them manipulate the tool kinesthetically and connect, make connections between skills, like saying subtracting a name of a number and how it relates to adding the additive inverse of the number. And so what's the design of these worksheets? Well, we provide them with an audio file that goes into the problem number one. And now we have the ability to embed these codes at specific steps, giving the students immediate access to content that shows them how to progress these steps. Problem two is there so that they can reflect on what they did on problem number one and see if they can get the problem on their own. Now, if we wanted to, we could provide them a complete solution of these two problems, worked out step by step. But how do we ensure they're going to continue their progression through uh, the zone of possible development? Well, what we do is we add additional problems and slightly increase the rigor to see if these students can progress to that higher level of thought. And so, with that said, an overview of this whole idea is that it leverages existing technology. It's also portable, scalable, and sustainable. It's just a piece of paper. It addresses multiple learning modalities. It's applicable to all subject areas. And most importantly, it is engaging to a student. When a student scans this, it's, there's elements of discovery there. So anyway, 
I'm Larry Perez from Saddleback College. If you'd like to see a sample of these worksheets, you can go to my faculty website, algebra2go.com slash QR. It's as happy as I can make this. Very good. Well, let's see, that brings us to uh, Jeffrey. Is right here. ask something like this. Why, when it comes to a test, do I suddenly not seem to remember what I know so well? I've heard this for years. Here are a few other things that might be familiar as I'm waiting for the slide to advance. I thought this was 15 seconds. Here we go. I do all the homework, but I mess up on tests. I've never been good at math or tests. You've heard it, right? Some student gave, told me that the very first day of the class. So he's already said, I'm basically not going to pass. Even though I screw up on the test, I understand everything. How about those words, right? I got it all. I got it all. I understand everything. What could be some possible reasons for this? Well, one is maybe the student really wasn't prepared for the course. That happens a lot. They're at the completely wrong level. Maybe they're not really interested in being in school. I can't figure out how you can learn anything if you don't really care about what you're learning. And there was a third thing there that you probably saw. But it's also possible the students, none of those things. Sometimes someone is prepared. They're at the right level, they have interest, their attendance is fine, they're doing the homework, they're taking good notes, something else is still wrong, and it could be with their cognition. Here's what we mean in psychology when you're talking about cognition. Perception, attention, memory, knowledge, language, problem solving, reasoning, and decision-making skills. And yet, when all of those are considered, which are very important, I don't, I'm not trying to minimize any of those, one of those is what I'm gonna focus on tomorrow. And in fact, one of those dominates all the others when it comes to cognitive psychology. That one gets the most attention. Now, you probably don't know which one it is. Here's a graph, though, wanna get your opinion on. What type of function does this seem to be? Now, you've probably never seen this graph before. I'll give you a hint, though, as a y-intercept, 0, 1, asymptotic behavior for the horizontal. There's a hint that's going to come up that says what I just said. I'm thinking ahead of this, but any ideas on what this might be? How about an exponential function, right? Decreasing function, doesn't it seem to be like that? Well, in fact, the man who came up with this is named Herman, Herman Ebbinghaus. 100 years ago this year, he died. He was the first psychologist to quantify the rate at which people forget. Nobody else had been able to do this in the past. He's also famous, by the way, for coming up with the introduction, methods, results, discussion section that's popular in research, still used a century later. This is the curve that he came up with. It's called the Ebbinghaus Forgetting Curve. You can find this easily online if you like. Look at what this is saying. If you get new information you've never heard of before, doesn't relate to anything you're really familiar with, and you do absolutely nothing with it, 20 minutes later, about 60% of that is all you'll still remember. An hour later, half, nine hours later, you're down to about a third. That's all you're still going to recall. Now, nobody's saying this exact graph is going to be the same for every single person in every single condition. It could be better, it could be worse. What does this tell us, though? First, new information that we get, that we don't practice, is going to eventually be lost. So it takes work to avoid forgetting. There are some exceptions, something that emotionally attacks you, you probably may remember. And there were some other things there. Now, probably most of us, even if you've never studied psychologists or psychology, understand this idea, and there's some students that do also, but many other people do not, and they simply decide, I'm not good at mathematics, and that's the end. Tomorrow, I'm gonna to talk to you about how students can learn better and remember better. It's at 10.30, the Red Room, Redwood Room. In fact, Rich, isn't that the only event happening at 10.30? Right. I think it is, right? So that's where you've got to be. Now, the other thing that sometimes happens, though, is that students get the idea that, hey, I show up for class, I'm there in the room, that means I should be taking in what I'm hearing. It turns out, though, information we get audit through our auditory system or our visual system doesn't sink in as well as things to which we attach meaning. And this is part of what's called semantic memory. The other mistake someone says is, well, wait a minute, I'm writing down everything that I heard in class, I've got these beautiful notes, it's all right there, why don't I remember it? Am I not learning it? Well, again, if somebody's not putting meaning to what they're hearing and they're not actively involved in it, they're not going to remember. I often tell students, learning is not a spectator sport. You can't just show up and kind of watch what's going on. You have to be involved. That's why I require participation. That's a component of their grade. They must get involved, and they're more likely to ask questions if they're used to doing that. 
So often that we find people are not. And in fact, procedural memory, which is what I've just referred to, is an aspect of long-term memory. Driving is another thing. Have you ever found yourself driving and realize your attention has been gone for a couple of seconds and you didn't swerve off the road? I think there was one more person that's supposed to be here, and that's, that's the guy. But anyway, tomorrow, Redwood Room, 10.30. You've heard it from Rich. Uh, I'm going to get it right. Supper. Super. You told me before and I messed it up. I'm sorry, Rich. I'm sorry, Rich. Anyway, tomorrow, 10.30. Thank you. Yes. Did Gail get here in time? Well, Gail! So you see, congratulations to me. And are you ready? I'm ready. Am I ever going to be, I guess? All right. Well, I'm so glad you made it. And we have a little bottle on the floor here. That's sort of your spot. You can just stand right there. I'll hand you this and tell me when you're ready, and I'll hit the button. I'm not sure I'm ready, uh, but go for it. OK. So I'm Gail Farrell from Michigan State University and I'm here to try to give you a little sense of what I'm going to talk about tomorrow and it has to do with building conceptual understanding um, using interactive dynamic mathematical software. And so why do we use technology? What's the purpose? And so some people use it for um, gathering data or thinking about burning calories. Um, one of the things that I'm pretty sure our kids use it for um, has nothing to do with teaching and learning. Um, but basically, that's what we should be changing how we think about technology. We should be rethinking what we can do with technology and the way we teach and learn so that we can use it as an instrument in making learning better. So there was a 1988 yearbook from NCTM that identified, this a long time ago, guys, excuse me, that identified common mistakes in algebra. 22 of them were related to fractions. Oh, look at all that, something happened. Um, there was another study that Tom Dick and I did um, about where kids mess up on high stakes assessments. And these are some of the, the, the those are the exit um, exams in um, the states across the nation and these kind of trends happen. And then one of the other studies that I looked at was what's happening in AP calculus and trying to figure out Excuse me, um, what are some things kids don't get? And you wouldn't be a bit surprised to know that if it has an LN in it, they don't get it. The scores are really bad. So students learn if they are, this is from the learning research, that if kids are involved in these four things, they will actually have a better chance of understanding. I really like this business about um, active engagement that I just walked in and heard. Um, and this business about struggle is very important. If people don't struggle with the concept, they're apt to not understand the lecture. They won't have that psychology of the time and that learning curve will go much faster. And so we're thinking about the role of technology. One of the things that's always been done, it, it always has kind of served, is as a servant. So it does the spreadsheet, it does the calculations, the computation. My stance is that if we think about technology as something to help us learn, like fractions, we can, we can do a better job. So here's some kind of interactive dynamic technology that can help kids learn what a fraction means and how they should be thinking about a fraction. And so the, another place where we can look, and I know that this kind of comes near and dear to you guys, um, variable by dragging that point on the number line, kids get a sense of input, output, what's changing, at what rate is it changing. The second one is to help them understand what, a, what does a solution mean. Um, algebra to pre-calculus, um, there's the inequalities, and you would be amazed at what high school kids do with inequalities. I'm sure some of your kids do the same thing. The one up on the upper right is about thinking about domain and range. Um, the one down on the bottom, oh, this new one on problem solving, this is a really cool thing. You drive with a Z naught, and then you have to guess what the rule is. So there's a rule on the left, and there's a really cool rule on the right if you want to play to the thing to play with. Um, here's an urn. So there's a lot of questions that you can ask about my urn. Um, I put water in the urn as I watch it fill. I'm looking at the relationship between the volume and the height, and I'm trying to figure out what is the connection between the shape of the urn and the rate of change that will produce a certain graph. And so I can, with just pulling on those little handles, I can change, and the kids can think about what kind, what shape urn would have a constant rate of change. What shape urn would have two points of inflection? 
Here's some stuff on calculus where, um, as you well know, calculus is probably one of the few places that people have spent a lot of time actually with um, trying to design and develop um, interactive objects that will help kids get a better understanding of what's going on. Statistics is another place where kids really don't get what correlation is. Um, they think it's causation. They're thinking that the higher the, the R value, the better the fit. And so here's an interactive dynamic set of um, things that you can look at. Here's another one about survey results and whether or not women have perfumes at a greater rate than boys do um, when they're in high school. And if you actually look at that, you know, they seem to actually. So you could make a null no hypothesis. Here's one on confidence interval where kids do all sorts of kids do sampling and gather their confidence intervals and points out the fact that they're not all exactly the same. Um, and as a matter of fact, you can have a confidence interval very close to what the original one was and you have a lot of different ones to try and help them understand what that is. So the basic idea is why technology? Technology is not just to collect data on your dates or not just to um, look at what the weather is like. Technology is to figure out how can I do a better job of teaching and learning. Well, I have a question. I mean, I'd like to know where we can find out about those tools. I don't know. Tomorrow. It's tomorrow? tomorrow. <laughs> this is a, pre like, a prelude to your talk. Prelude tomorrow. to the presentation. <coughs> and I tomorrow. All right. All right. Good. And this is Teresa. <laughs> Teresa. All right. You let me know. Put your ball right there. Ready. Yeah. <laughs> ready? <laughs> I'm ready. Are you ready? Okay. Go. Hi, I'm Teresa Sutcliffe, professor at Los Angeles Valley College. Uh, I have a confession to make. I'm not really very passionate about math. <laughs> My <laughs> passion is really helping students learn. Okay. I did manage to get a PhD. I don't know how that happened, but anyway. <laughs> Flip the switch is my passion, and I even wear it on my shirt, okay? What does it mean? I've been ta talking about it, flip the switch, and I guess you guys can say, yeah, I first heard it from my husband. I'm not from this country, I'm from the Philippines. And when I heard flip the switch, I said, that's what I call it. And I thought it was actually really inverting the switch, you know, because I'm not an England. You know. Then I realized one time when I was looking at the switch, I said, oh, that's what he meant. You flip the switch to turn the light on, or off, of course, okay? So, yeah, I said, duh. But then I was happy about calling my method that because something happened to me in spring of 1997, and ever since then, that's a long time ago, right? These light bulbs have been flashing, like, okay, that's how I can help my students. One of which was activist seems better than passive, right? So active learning is better than passive learning. So I said, yeah, of course, I should stop talking. Then I realized not too long ago that active doesn't have to mean interactive. You know, we have this kind of thing that we think they have to be all over the place, talking, discussing, for active learning to occur, okay? That when we teach, it doesn't mean that we have to lecture. How many of you have kids? Do you teach them by lecturing? <laughs> so, so teaching doesn't really necessarily mean lecturing. And when we lecture, it doesn't really necessarily mean that we're teaching. We could be talking and talking and talking and nothing's entering, right? So, is it not done? <laughs> what is that? Can somebody help me with that? Less is more, okay? And that's what I found out. The less I do of what I traditionally used to do, the better my students are becoming. You know, less is more. Student success. We all talk about student success. I realize, gee, they're talking about so many different things. Several definitions. Engaging the students. People seem to think that to engage the students, yeah, you have to do very active stuff, move the chairs, face each other, and so on and so forth. A lecture could be engaging, right? Newer doesn't necessarily mean better. A lot of us think we have to use the latest technology in order to help our students succeed. I am very old-fashioned, very traditional, so I don't think that. I think the goal of what we're doing is critical thinking, because critical thinking hopefully can help us enjoy our lives better. If we know how to think critically, we could be happier people. Math, step one I thought was to understand, and then you can do, right? So I was part of the course outline committee, and I said, well, we have to have them understand, and then the chair said, no, they have to be able to do. 
But then I thought about it some more and I said, well, maybe they have to do first. Maybe they can just do it first and then understand later what they're doing. Okay, so I was really kind of confused there. And then yesterday I said, or maybe they just want to do it. We want to do things, not because we understand, right? We do a lot of things because we like doing those things. We love doing those things. Okay, so maybe math is one of those. Yeah, Rich said doing math is isomorphic to playing golf. Okay. You can guess that, you know, somebody said math is not, learning is what? It's not a spectator sport, right? So to me, the pencil is the golf club. I'm a strong believer, believer in the pencil and paper math, okay? That's how I get my students to do their basic math. I use a lot of pencils in my class. The other light bulb is, of course, we know our math, but it is not necessary. It is necessary, but it's not sufficient for teaching. We may know it, but maybe we don't know how to, you know, that's how you do it. More material doesn't necessarily mean better learning. We try to put a lot of content in our courses, but students don't really learn anything because of, it's too much. Last semester, I finally figured out that negative plus negative is Negative. How do you think I figured it out? And you'll find out tomorrow. That's why I'm teaching you to come. Bottom line is, I've been teaching since 1996 here in this country. And I found out that no matter what I do, if I care, my students will care. Okay? So anyway, I hope those balls help spark some interest in my talk tomorrow too in the Red Doctor Room. Thank you so much. Uh, I'd like to just take a moment before my talk, which is about them again, to introduce four people who are students of mine who came here tonight. And I'm really delighted. We have Eric Lynn, <laughs> and Jerry Liu, and who snuck in after the presentation had just begun. We have Grace <laughs> and Young. They are all in my math uh, 3B, that's the second semester calculus course, it's an honors course at Urban Valley College. And um, I'm about to give a presentation that you guys are very familiar already with. You remember the meow from last semester? Well, <laughs> you don't because you weren't in the class, but these three were in the class last semester. A meow is a math enrichment opportunity of the week. A meow. And in my honors class, I make sure that they uh, get to do a meow every week. And one of the meows last semester had to do with a uh, problem in number theory, which I found, have found very interesting since I was a kid. So am I ready? I don't think I'm ready. <laughs> am I ready now? Go, Rich! Well, okay, I guess I'm ready. I'm a little afraid because I haven't done this since Jacksonville, and I didn't even look at the slides. All right, here we go. All right, so it's entitled a Mathemat Numerical Fulcrums, a Mathematical Exploration from Pre-Algebra to Post-Calculus, meaning there's something for everybody. Um, when I was in high school, a teacher of mine gave me this puzzle. It was about a, uh, can the professor find the address on the street in which he knew only that of all the houses on the street, this particular address had the property that the sum of all of the numbers below it was equal to the sum of the numbers above it, up to the highest number. And it turned out it was a 204. Well, that's called a numerical center. Here's an example. Six is the balance point, is the numerical center of the numbers one through eight, because the sum of one through five equals seven plus eight. So six is the numerical center of one to eight. But not every number is a numerical center. For example, five doesn't work in any list. One through six, five, no, one through four is too heavy. Uh, if you add a seven on the end of the list, then six and seven are too heavy. So five isn't just gonna be the balance point for any of them. But 35 is a numerical center for the list one through 49. As you can see, the sums on either side are the same. <sighs> I get to relax for a minute. So the question is, is one a numerical center? It turns out it's kind of convenient to call one a numerical center. It's kind of like it, there's a, an empty set on both sides and they both have the same sum. So I'm gonna say one, arguably, is the first numerical center. And there's six and 35 and 204. Well, they're like buried treasure. Students of all abilities can experience the thrill of discovery. There's patterns galore. 
And in fact, you might think, what's the next one after? Well, there it is. <laughs> 1, 6, 35, 204, 1189, 6, 9, 30, and so on. Is there a pattern? Well, there is a recursion relation that actually depends upon the two prior numbers to get to the next number. I'll let you find it. But Young, right over here, found that recursion relation last semester. And it depends only on the one prior number. Look at that. Woo! That's outstanding. Is there a general formula that predicts the nth numerical center? And several of the students, this was the, the meow asked for more points if you could find a formula. And they did. Some found the formula for the nth numerical center, and it's connected to the formula for the nth Fibonacci number. Um, here's an interesting property. It turns out that the square of any numerical center is also a triangular number. So take 6, for example. 6 squared is 36, but 8. A, a, a triangle of side 8 also has 36 um, squares in it. This is just a, a shot of a local shopping center called Triangle Square in Costa Mesa. <laughs> and I just threw it in there because it's cute, you know, it's Triangle Square. <laughs> now, the talk was about numerical fulcrums. A fulcrum number is a little different. It's similar to numerical center, but the list of consecutive natural numbers doesn't have to begin with 1. 14, for example, separates the list from 4 through 19. And 9 is a fulcrum for two different lists, 6 through 11 and 3 through 12. This is, this is really quite interesting. This is where it starts to get even more fascinating. I had a student, okay, I can relax again for a moment. All right, I had a student, R.J. Lilgis' room, in 2002. He discovered and proved a very significant theorem about numerical fulcrums. F is not a numerical fulcrum. If and only if, 4 times f squared plus 1 is a prime number. What? Yes, this is amazing. For example, and I probably won't get through this, but 101 is 4 times 5 squared plus 1. It's prime. Therefore, 5 is not a numerical fulcrum. And the other example showed one that was. Um, there's RJ on my left. <laughs> and my mentor from Harvey Mudd College. Do you recognize him, Jack? Yeah. yeah. And so anyway, <laughs> what's his name? Correct. No. <laughs> Borelli. Why is RJ's theorem so significant? Well, in 1912, at the International Congress of Mathematicians, Edmund Landau asked four questions about prime numbers. His fourth question was, are there infinitely many primes of the form n squared plus 1? 100 years later, nobody knows. Question's unresolved. But because of RJ's theorem, Landau's question is equivalent to asking, are there infinitely many natural numbers that are not numerical fulcrums? And if that answer is yes, then Landau's question gets answered yes. And maybe one of your students will find the answer. Thank you. And our last speaker of the night, Fred Felton. Okay, Rich, I guess I'm ready. Go for it. I'm going to do the seemingly impossible. And that's give two talks in five minutes. <laughs> the first one, uh, they are both on technology. One's a technology, the other is a pedagogy that changed my life. The first one is more related to the online components of teaching. But whether you're teaching in the classroom or online, you, you know that lecture is the worst way to possibly engage students in your subject matter and to encourage independent thinking. But in mathematics, we have a problem because of the notation. Still, you want to make sure students participate actively in your course and that they communicate mathematically with you and with each other. Do not let the difficulty of the notation stop you from in encouraging your students to communicate mathematically. So the problem I faced was, how do you get graphing calculator screenshots? How do you communicate using your handwriting? How do you tell, how does a student say, I'm having a problem with this exercise for my homework without having to type the, the thing out. It'd be nice to have a screenshot of that problem, of your graphing calculator, etc. And I'm able to do that with free software called Jane, available from TechSmith, the company that wrote Camtasia. So I suggest you go to that website, download that software, teach your students how to use it. Here's how it works. Once you download the Jane, there's a sun that hovers at the edge of your screen. 
But there is no embed HTML code. You have to add that by going through the steps that you see here. Don't worry about taking notes. This presentation is available online. You'll see the website at the end of the talk. So add an embed HTML button. Once you hover your mouse over it, it wiggles and lets you know that you can now do this. So here is an example of something I scanned, some handwriting of mine. Anything that appears on your screen can be captured and posted inside of a discussion board. You can add boxes, arrows, and so on, and I encourage you to do that. The program that we use at Coastline is Pearson. There are legacy courses called Course Compass, and there's one way to do that by just pasting what's in your clipboard into your discussion board message, but it's a lot more complicated if you're using a new design course. This is worth its weight in gold. If you're using my math lab and your course is new design, you click on, you do a right click inside the discussion board and choose paste HTML. There may be other choices that seem obvious, but use the paste HTML command and that will stick the embed code in your discussion board message and that concludes my first talk. Thank you very much. <laughs> I highly encourage you to include writing and research components when you teach. Again, whether it's online or in the classroom. I used to have students watch some videos, write a report, and email it to me, and the consistency and the quality was very poor. Then I read all the research about peer review, and it's amazing. Overnight, when students realized that their work was going to be viewed, commented on, and rated by their fellow students, the quality shot sky high. The difference was unbelievable. I did nothing different. It just turns out that you, the professor, you're not an authentic audience. <laughs> so the program I chose is Zoho. Actually, I started with Google No, that's no longer being supported. Now I chose Zoho, Zoho Docs. It even includes a LaTeX editor, which is very cool. But if you're worried about the effort and work not being put forth by you to grade students' paper. Here's an example of how accurate peer review is. It turns out that students statistically significantly grade their fellow classmates' work about the same as you would, maybe even a little more difficult. If they had to grade their own work, that was the second graph you saw earlier, maybe they might be a little more generous. But basically, students grade their own work about the same as you would. And in fact, Massive online open courses use the concept of peer review, and it's coming, ladies and gentlemen. In fact, our academic senate today, or rather this week, heavily debated MOOCs. And I'm telling you, it's coming. And, and, but it's really nothing new. I mean, do you know the, the greatcourses.com, the, the little CDs and DVDs you used to buy for $100 or $200? And, and, and they, were, they were taught by a very famous professor, and well, so are MOOCs. There's nothing different, there's nothing new about MOOCs. Don't be alarmed by them. Uh, I attribute peer review to the positive ratings and comments that I get from my liberal arts math course, and I recommend that you implement it in any course that, that you teach as well. The, the, the work that you have to do is minimal. Your students do all the work. Don't you love it? <laughs> Don't you love that idea? And that's about it. Any questions? Well, I'd like to thank the presenters and also the audience for being terrific. This was the debut, and we'll do this every year, sure. And while this was already, I think the desserts have been brought out, and it's time to help yourselves and stick around for game night. Pearson is bringing out a Wii, and we'll have more games on the tables. Good night.